Good evening and welcome to our event tonight. My name is Amanda and I work for the Braven team here in the Irish Hospice Foundation. We are a national charity working towards enhancing the care people receive and their family receive at the end of life, at the time of death and into bereavement. Part of our work is around creating spaces for people to come together around bereavement. We usually host this type of event in a community space, bringing people together physically. Last year we had three events, one in Dublin, one in Cork and one in Galway. Tonight is the first time we've held this type of event virtually. So please forgive us if we have a few technology hiccups. Just wanted to acknowledge before I did hand you over to Breed. Tonight we do have people here who've experienced the death of someone close. The death may have been recent. It may have occurred before the pandemic or it may have occurred many years ago. The death could have been sudden or it could have been through a chronic illness. You may have experienced the death of a parent, a sister or brother, a child, an aunt, uncle, grandparent, friend or work colleague, or you may be here tonight looking to know how to help someone who's bereaved in your life. COVID-19 has impacted us in so many different ways. It has affected our feelings of safety, our sense of control, how predictable we feel the world is. Some have lost jobs and we've also limited contact with people outside our host household. This in turn has also impacted how we grieve. We may have not been able to be with the person when they died. We may not have been able to have the funeral ritual we would have wished to have had. We may have had limited contact with the family and friends for the emotional and practical support we need after we lose, some, lose someone that we care about. So tonight is about coming together. Tonight some are viewing this event on their own. Some are viewing it with family and friends. But we all have one thing in common. Someone has died that is really important to us or someone in our life, we're looking to support someone in our life who's been bereaved. To the people who are on their own watching this tonight, please know that there are 500 other people watching this screen at this very moment in time. This evening is for all of you. Our guest speaker, Breed, has many years of experience working with families and people who've been bereaved. Tonight, she'll speak about the different ways that we, that we can feel and experience grief. Some of these will sound familiar to you and others won't, and that's okay because we all grieve differently. Breed would also speak about ways we can help ourselves and ways we can help other people. Tonight you can engage whatever way you wish. You can sit there and listen to the talk, or you can ask questions also at the Q&A section at the end. Before I hand over to Breed, just a little bit of a note on some practical issues. Breed and myself and other attendees cannot see or hear you throughout tonight, she will be only able to see and hear myself and Breed. After the talk, we'll have a little bit of time for some questions. And throughout the evening, you can type into the Q&A function that we have on this webinar. So if you move your mouse down the lower part of your screen, a Q&A box or button should be there. You can press on the button and a text box should come up and you can type in your question there. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. And then after our Q&A, Breed will close the event and then we'll have some slides at the end while everyone's logging off, just for some resources if you would like to find out more information. Also just to note that the event will be recorded tonight and put on our website, but throughout the whole event you will remain anonymous as we can't see or hear you at all. And I just want to really thank Breed for agreeing to speak for us tonight and I'm really happy to be able to hand over to Breed now. Are the conflicts that we might have had with the person who has gone? So be gentle with yourself as you think about it and consider for each of you, you know, what is the unique meaning for me in my household, in my community at this time of the loss I'm going through. When we turn around and we think about grief too, we think about it affecting us in several different ways. And I think this is where the confusion comes in in relation to it. We find that we end up in a situation where it affects us physically. If you think about this, it will probably affect you where you carry your most stress. And if you're in times of stress along the way, I'm sure there are times you think, oh my goodness, I'm always having headaches. Maybe the thought process and the poor old head is too full. Or it could be that you carry it in your chest, in your heart. So often I listen to bereaved parents talk about the pain of the broken heart. Or it may be that you've carried it in your tummy and you constantly find 
that you've tummy upset. And one of the things we find sometimes in that grief is that we also carry perhaps the symptoms of an illness that somebody had. We call it symptomatology. And I think, you know, it's always worth checking this out with the GP, but also realize that very often we can take on board the symptoms of our loved one, particularly if we've been looking after them for a long time. So be gentle with yourself in that. And realize that probably if you're in the early days of grief, that you actually find that grief has actually soaked into every tissue of your being at the moment. That you have aches and pains and lethargy. And that you're emotionally so exhausted these days. You could sleep all the hours God sends and still not feel rested. We also find that our thinking gets affected. And again, if we're in the early days of loss, we find that, you know, it takes over 24 seven. That we are absolutely preoccupied with all that has happened. And particularly, you know, if we have had a loss through COVID in these times, the trauma of it all impacts. It's very similar to the trauma that those who experience tragic, sudden deaths in their lives also experience. So we will see that our thinking has taken over. We find a major disbelief in the beginning. Could this really be happening? I don't believe it. It's like a bad dream. I'm going to wake up and somebody's going to tell me it hasn't happened at all. Or we find that it actually affects us in our behaviours, our sleep patterns, going to bed early, not finding yourself able to fall asleep. And one of the things we can do with that is actually to pause and allow ourselves to actually take time in our day to be with our grief. Not all of the time, but even just five minutes to sit with a song, perhaps. Something belonged to the person who has gone. Just a gentle way of being with them. Not putting pressure on yourself, but making an appointment with your loss. What we find in it as well is that so often, you know, we realise that men and women grieve differently. So often I think, you know, I watch men turn around and say, you know, give me a task and I'll get through it. And I see them create beautiful corners in the garden, little gardens of remembrance, tall sheds, all sorts of things, wood carvings, all of these. Whereas we as women so often, a lot of the time, will talk our way through our losses. And then again, we will have the whole idea of people saying, is there a roadmap to this grief? And I often imagine it to be like a valley that we move from our loss right through this valley, through the shock and the numbness and the yearning for the person we've lost. We hit our reality and all the feelings that are in there. And we move forward into loneliness and into doing new things with our lives. And eventually in time, coming to a place of accommodation where we actually weave this tragic, sad time that we're going through into the story of our lives. That will take time. There will be many emotions will arise. We may feel angry at times. And often when we unpick it, we realize it's about the unfairness we feel that this has happened to us. Why was it us? Why was it me? Why was it my family member? We find guilt a lot of the time. And we blame ourselves for all sorts of things. And the thing about it is, we can get caught in that. And that can be one of our sticking points along the way. We also can get stuck when we feel this has been going on for quite a while and people are tired of listening to me. One of the things I would say to you is find the people who are the good listeners. Maybe only one or two. 
That's enough. Find your time with them. Tell them how you feel. Find the doers in your life too. You know the one that will go to the supermarket for you on the day that you just don't feel like facing out of the house. These are important friends to have. And the ones too who will say, come on, we'll get you into the car now when these restrictions have lifted or we'll take you for a drive. We need these people. These are the supports we need to help us through. When we think of that roadmap, it doesn't go along in a nice straight line. We realize that it moves in an hour, in a moment, in a day. And we constantly move in flow from our loss to our day-to-day -day tasks. What has happened to that in COVID-19? And the thing about it is that our worldview was shattered. This world became a very unsafe place for all of us. The fear of those early days of this impending invisible invader that was coming at us. And if we actually think about it, we lost any sense of our human needs. We had no power over it. We lost our sense of control. There was certainly no fun and we had lost our freedom as well. We found as well that even our sense of belonging, that those we love most were left at a distance to us. When we think about it, we think the basic need for survival and our own safety is what we've gone through. We have been in survival mode for just over a hundred days. When we turn around and we think about that, we realize that it brings up all sorts of different types of grief. We have the shattered assumptions that our worldview has changed and we have got more fearful and insecure in ourselves, feeling very, very vulnerable. There are many people, not just the over 70s, who are finding it hard to emerge from their cocoons these days. If we are bereaved, it's very easy to stay at home and be in that quiet place. And as these restrictions are lifted, we find the reality is dawning with us. And the pain of what we've been through is beginning to be realized. Not just the bereavement we had that perhaps we had experienced even pre-COVID or even a few years earlier, but the losses we've had through COVID along with the cumulative losses of loss of job and finances, of freedom, of a good hug and human presence, of the loss of our rites of passage. So we had anticipatory loss, because perhaps for some of us, we did not get our opportunity to say goodbye. And I think one thing that COVID did for us is that we became aware of letter writing again. I think, as many families have had in the past for tragic losses, unfinished business arises. And perhaps we need in our own time to sit and write a letter to the one that's gone. Of putting down how we feel. Of saying our goodbye. Of having our own private ritual. When we think of it as well, we've had other losses that have gone on, the non-finite losses of the sixth class students that never got the chance to finish primary school, or the Leaving Cert students that never said goodbye in a good healthy way to their school lives. All of these, the plans that people had that had to be put on hold. What we find people saying is, you know, there has been a huge problem in terms of the extra burdens of having to homeschool, to work from home, the busyness of that work from home, of fearing finances, of all the other difficulties of juggling so much. And I don't think that any of us as human beings, if we're going through grief, 
would find it easy, even the most resilient, to take on those burdens as well as our grief. So what we find in it is the normal grieving that we talked about earlier doesn't quite hold maintaining the roadmap. Our control was taken away from us. And now in time, we need to regain it. Quotations I've heard from people in the last few weeks were, before this, my grief was devastating, but I was somehow managing. Now I can barely function and it doesn't seem manageable anymore. Or I've been so busy worrying about the kids and schooling, my finances and my safety and working from home and urgency of work, that my grief feels secondary. Grief has felt suspended, sidelined. And the reassurance I want to give you at this point is, it's okay. Our, may, our grief may have felt all consuming, but we haven't had time to actually process it. We feel guilty because we're not. We feel we've been disloyal to the one who has gone. We may also think that we are grieving wrongly, but I can assure you we're not. At present, it's too hard to process our losses because we're in an uncertain world. We are too vulnerable. We are disconnected from the supports we need to do so. But when things feel safer, it will be easier to do so. And when life is more settled there, there will be time. Because grieving does take time. It will be waiting for us. It will ask us to participate be active in our grieving, of realising we can choose to walk with it. It has been a time of survival and we're coming through. And I think each and every one of us, whether we were on the front line facing all the trauma, or in our homes, isolated with our singular loss, we need to actually give ourselves credit for what we have actually contributed to in the last few months and what we have survived. What might help these days ahead is to know that you have choice to regain control. How can I do it? Reconnect with ourselves first. Take that short walk. Or what are the little things you delight in? Maybe it's that first cup of coffee, maybe no takeaway from your favorite coffee shop. But the little things, listen to the bird song. Let nature heal you. And when you're strong, then you can face your grief. Reconnect with the friends, the doers, the recreational, and the listeners. Prepare the rituals that you haven't yet had a chance to carry out for your loved one. We will have a winter of memorials. Now you have time to create rituals that can be very personal and very meaningful when the time comes. Because in the control that was taken away from us, our grieving has been delayed. Tell the stories. Remember, reminisce. These give us the connections. And when you want to make an appointment with your grief, whether you do so in a journal, or just being with yourself, or playing some music, these are some of the ways that can help. And one of the things to realize is, know that if it becomes too much of a burden for you, there is more support out there. You are not alone. You can reach to the friends. The IHF helpline. And all the other resources that can signpost you to the best help for you. One of the things we realise in grief is that we have a story to tell. 
the story of the event that has happened, no matter how traumatic. A story of the person who has gone, who they were, the character in our lives, the relationship. A story of their legacy, what they have left for us to live by. And in time, if we're faithful to those stories, which we can express in any way we like, not necessarily in words, it could be in paintings, it could be in creations, but in time, it will help us to tell the story of our own adjustment. Beautiful poem that I came across on YouTube just this week is called Today We Mourn You Differently. It's by Kevin McCormick. He's a mindfulness teacher. I just cite the very last verse. Let us realize that the one who has gone from us, we don't have to leave behind. If we're faithful to the journey of grief through the intense pain and the missing in the future, we we'll learn that their essence walks with us every day. And in fact, those that have gone before us can walk beside us. And Kevin captures that in these words. Today, we mourned you differently. But this much is true. You are gone, but not without a trace. As you are in every face you leave behind, in every imprint of your foot on the path, you so diligently wore from the rose bushes to the kitchen door. Today, we mourn you differently. Thank you. Thanks a million, Breed. Um, we just have a, a couple of minutes for questions. Is that okay? That's okay. A couple of questions come in here. And the first question is around a family member dying in a nursing home and that the guilt that the person feels around not seeing them beforehand and then being there when they died. Mm -hmm. And again, it's that piece that I, I say with unfinished business. It's going to take time. The, I, the pain of that at the moment has to be so huge and so intense. And the emotional response, because this person is only coming out of the trauma of having lost somebody in the nursing home. And the fact that there was the barrier between them. And it's in time of being able to come back and recognize the relationship they had in life right up until that point. And it's, actually, if we find it so often with the death of a loved one to suicide, we're often in time, we have to actually put the loss back into perspective for ourselves. But it's very natural and very normal to feel that guilt at the moment. Perhaps that letter that could be written, just saying, you know, and remembering as it's written. I often say, write it in a way that it's not from the head, but from the heart, that the pen does the talking. You know, I am so sorry it ended like this. This is what I'd like to say and just let the pen do it. It can be cathartic. Thanks a million, Breed. Uh, we just have another uh, question as well from uh, an attendee. I lost my husband two years ago to cancer. On the surface, I appear to be coping, but I'm not. How can I move on? I think, again, two years down the road can be a very difficult place. Uh, you know, again, somebody has lost their husband and you, you can be busy and you can actually you know, find it so difficult. And again, it depends on what supports this person has around them. I often think to go to find at that stage uh, is some group that actually supports the bereaved, that, can, that they can go and actually talk to somebody and be heard outside of the family of that. Because this is obviously somebody who has a controlled coping of I put on the face and I put on the mask for the people I meet. And maybe just having one space to let down that mask. Again, I would say the helpline can maybe guide this person to the type of support they require. Thanks a million, Breed. Um, can I ask you another one? Yes, love. <laughs> so uh, what do you do when the wave of emotion comes out of nowhere? And it's not like you were sad right before it. The wave can be overwhelming. Absolutely. And this is what we call being ambushed by grief. You know, you're going about your business having your ordinary day and suddenly you're sideswiped and it could be a piece of music it could be anything it could be just a thought in your head that suddenly 
And the thing about it is, what I would say is, sit with it. Lean into it for a while. Be reassured. It's not going to wipe you out. It's like that, watching the tide coming in and the one in seven wave that knocks us off our feet. But stay in it. And it's unbelievable what little gems you find there. Because you can find connection. And that's the most important thing. Thanks, Freed. And um, we just have another question from Lindsay, and they're really looking for any advice for the workplace um, around managers to support bereaved employees. Now, just to let you know, Breed, that we're going to have a talk in about two weeks around grief in the workplace. Yes. Yeah. Want to give us a, a little bit of a steer for the for this attendee? I, I think the the one first, the first thing I often say is, you know, so often workplaces will come along and say, "Oh, well, how are we going to help?" I say, ask the person what they need as they're returning to work. They will guide you as to what they need from the workplace. But we forget to do that. Everybody's making arrangements as how they're going to look after Johnny or Mary, and nobody asks Johnny or Mary what they would like from the workplace. And I think that's going to be important. And again, taking in the realisation of so many of these facets that we're going to have to support now, realizing that grief is much more complex than it was pre-COVID. And it's the complexity of it that we need to be aware of. Thanks, Brie. Can I just have one final question? Yes, yeah. Just around, um, one question around what do you say to someone who's bereaved? A lot of people sometimes feel, I don't want to say anything, I don't want to upset them, I don't want to make them think about it. What's, what's the right, or what would you recommend that people do? Mm -hmm. And I think I think it, it depends. It, it, I, I always think of seeing a, a bereaved mum one day on the street and, and somebody with me was immediately going, oh, you know, and the lady just put her hand up and said, not today, and walked into a shop. So she wasn't able to talk. And I think sometimes it's about, we, we, are, we come along and we use that phrase so often, how are you feeling, you know, with the tilt of the head. And the thing about it is, I would far rather say to somebody, and how are you coping? And what's the most difficult thing this week? And is there anything I can do for you? And be genuine about it, not, oh, I'm there for you, never to be seen again. And I think that's where you can really help. Be led by the bereaved. I definitely promise this is the very, very last question. Okay. <laughs> Just someone uh, put in a message that their partner's third anniversary is on, on this Thursday. Yes. I want to know why is it still so raw? I think one of the things that we don't realise about anniversary time is it is our season of grief. And I think for every single one of us who have gone through loss, that actually the time of year coming up, for a couple of weeks coming up to the, to the anniversary, all of the grief in us is disturbed. Sometimes subconsciously, we're not even aware of what it's about. And that in fact, you find you go through the an anniversary then, and somewhere in your subconscious, you're actually reliving the events of the loss without realizing maybe very consciously in your mind. And then when the, when the anniversary is done, again, finding the ritual you want to do for it, you know, whether it's a private ritual or whether it's a little bit more public with, with supports, these days it has to be so private in lots of ways. And then you find that you begin to rise out of it again. But three years, and I will say three years after losing a partner, is not a long time in grief. And that's not taking away any hope from anybody, but it's realizing, you know, grief takes time before we come. And I'm not even going to use the term anymore to a place of accommodation because we're hearing that word new normal so often. I don't believe there's such a place. Thanks a million, Breed. That's all our Thank time that we have for questions. Would you like to um, take a couple of minutes to close the event? And just to okay. let people know that we're going to uh, make this recording available on our website and we'll keep people posted. Whoever registered will let them know. Um, thanks so much, Breed. I really appreciate it. And um, you, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, everybody, for attending tonight. If you even just take away one line of what has been said tonight and that I can help you for the next three months, so be it. Be gentle with yourself in the days ahead. We've been through one hell of a tough time. And that, combined with grief, is just so, so big. And be gentle. Pace yourself.
Like all crises, find someone to talk to. And remember, Amanda is putting up on the screen when we're finished, the resources that you can find help from. Remember, grief doesn't go away. What actually happens is we grow to accommodate it. We become bigger people. And that will take time. I think the poet John O'Donoghue wrote a beautiful piece in the poem for grief. And I'll leave you with this thought. Just close your eyes and listen gently. When you lose someone you love, your life becomes strange. And the ground beneath you becomes fragile and your thoughts make your eyes unsure. And some dead echo drags your voice down where words have no confidence. Your heart has grown heavy with loss. And though this loss has wounded others too, no one knows what has been taken from you when the silence of absence deepens. Flickers of guilt kindle regret for all that was left unsaid or undone. There are days when you wake up happy again inside the fullness of life until the moment breaks and you're thrown back onto the black tide of loss. Days when you have your heart back. You're able to function well until in the middle of work or encounter, suddenly with no warning, you're ambushed by grief. It becomes hard to trust yourself. All you can depend on now is that sorrow will remain faithful to itself. More than you, it knows its way and will find the right time to pull and pull the rope of grief until that coiled hill of tears has reduced to its last drop. Gradually, you will learn acquaintance with the invisible form of your loved one. When the work of grief is done, the wound of loss will heal, and you will have learned to wean your eyes from the gap in the air and be able to enter the hearth in your soul where your loved one has awaited your return all the while. Take care, stay safe, and be gentle to yourself in the hours ahead. Thank you.